Today's scriptures come from Exodus 20, 14 and Matthew 5, 27 28. And it reads, You shall not commit adultery. You have heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading of Today we're looking at the seventh of the Ten Commandments. You shall not commit adultery. I'll admit to you that I approach this subject with a certain amount of trepidation. I feel a little bit like the third grade Sunday school teacher who was worried about giving the class a lesson on the same passage. The teacher asked the students, Will someone, explain, or, someone please explain what adultery means. And one child raised his hand and matter of fact said, Adultery is when a kid lies about his age. <laughs> such an intensely personal and private and crucial topic like the proper role of sex in a person's life. There are so many ways to be misunderstood, so many opportunities to put your foot in your mouth or to misspeak, so it's a little intimidating. That's the kind of thing I want to avoid today. I'd really rather not even talk about this today. <laughs> However, the subjects of sex and sexuality come up many times in the Bible. And in fact, Scripture is very frank when addressing the topic of sex. It makes it clear that this is a very important issue and that we must understand it correctly. Sometimes we're uncomfortable with the subject because it is a very personal matter and it is not something that we talk about much in church. However, if we ignore it, then we're ignoring what God has to tell us about an important aspect of our lives. And frankly, it's downright silly for Christians who are married and who have children to pretend that they don't know anything about sex or that they don't care or think about such things. And we're not fooling anybody when we talk like that. So I'm going to do the best job I can, and if I turn all red, go ahead and laugh at me. <laughs> but let's still see if God can speak through me on this subject that affects us all. I am glad the kids are downstairs. <laughs> In truth, I find that Christians are often conflicted when discussing sex. On one hand, we realize that we're supposed to be different from non-Christians. And that the world we live in is literally obsessed with the whole subject. We read in the Bible that we are not to conform to the world, but to look at things from God's point of view. And so we try not to be like our sex-obsessed culture. But on the other hand, we also read in the Bible that God has given us the gift of sex to be the fullest expression of union between a husband and a wife. And that sex, kept in the proper context, solidifies that marriage bond like nothing else can. Someone put it rightly, sex is a wonderful, holy part of the relationship between a husband and a wife. But it's also the best way to sell blue jeans. <laughs> we get mixed messages about this whole subject of sex. So, so where's the balance? How should we look at this whole subject? What is the Christian, biblical perspective on sex? Father was once telling his little boy about the facts of life. And about halfway through the father's explanation, the boy interrupted him and asked, do you think God knows about all this? <laughs> well, the Christian perspective begins with the realization that God not only knows all about this, but that He created it. It is from Him. We've been studying God's rules for living, as presented in the Ten Commandments. And with each of the commandments, we have seen how it counteracts at least one myth or a lie that our <coughs> sinful culture tries to get us to believe. I know the guys have been able to live a full, good, free life. We've been told many lies. We've also seen how believing that lie doesn't really lead to more freedom or happiness or fulfillment, but actually just the opposite. It just leads to more misery, pain, <coughs> bitterness, and tragedy in life. And so with this seventh commandment, there is not just one lie going against it, but a whole bunch of lies about sexuality that the world tries to get us to believe and to convince us that, that they're true. Here are some of the cultural myths about sexuality. And then we'll talk about God's truth regarding the subject. Myth number one is that sex is merely a physical act. It's hard to know where to start with this one. The simple fact is that so much of what we see and hear and experience in our everyday lives is sending us this message on one level or another. That sex is merely something physical. That there's no more meaningful thing to it than just satisfying a hunger for food or a scratching an itch or just a fulfilling a desire to get it out of your brain. 
Nothing could be further from the truth. Last week we studied the sixth commandment, which said you shall not murder. And I pointed out then how human life has a built-in value. We're not merely the most advanced of all the animals, but we are beings created by God with a divine purpose and meaning for our lives. We are a different kind of creature <coughs> altogether than even the most advanced of all the other animals. People are special. They're sacred, at least in God's eyes, if not our own. To then assert that sex is merely a physical act between two people is, again, to reduce people to being mere animals. Proponents of this view say that sex is merely a biological imperative, solely a function of our evolutionary drive to reproduce. And if that's the case, then goes the reasoning that we might as well have as much sex with as, as, as we can, with as many people as we can. However, God tells us from the very beginning that sex has been so much more than just a physical act. Paul wrote to the early Christians in 1 Corinthians 6.15, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two shall become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. And then verse 18 goes on to say, flee from sexual immorality. A contemporary paraphrase of that passage by Eugene Peterson called The Message puts that passage this way. There's more to sex than mere skin on skin. Sex is as much a spiritual mystery as a physical fact. As written in scripture, the two become one. Since we want to become spiritually one with the master, we must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids commitment and intimacy, leaving us more lonely than ever. That kind of sex can never become one. Older folks here might remember Paul Harvey's old radio show. He used to advertise a product called J.B. Weld. Evidently, it was a kind of, of super glue of sorts that uh, consisted of two separate tubes. And if you squeeze a little bit out of each tube and let them sit, nothing happens. But if you mix them together, then it becomes a mixture that bonds metal and do all sorts of, of wonderful things. Apart, they do nothing, but together they become very strong, probably due to some kind of chemical reaction that happens when they mix. Well, sex in a marriage relationship is somewhat like that chemical reaction that allows two separate things to become one durable substance. It solidifies two people into one flesh, bonding them emotionally, spiritually, and psychologically. It sets that relationship in place between a husband and wife. And that's the purpose of that sexual component of the relationship. And so rather than being just merely a physical act with no real consequences, sex joins two people in a very unique way. Now, we readily warn people about the physical consequences of sex, pregnancy and disease and all those kinds of things, and, and rightfully so. But we're always trying to convince ourselves that there are no spiritual or emotional or psychological consequences. The shows that we watch, the, the movies that we see, the books that we read, the advertising that we're continually exposed to, all depict the supposed illicit thrill of sex with no consequences. And so we give school children condoms and say to them, well, here you go, now nothing bad can happen to you. And we're reinforcing this lie. And where I'm going with this is in relation to the seventh commandment. The reason adultery has become so commonplace today is that so many people have believed this lie that there are no consequences for the sin. Most people will acknowledge that it's a sin. I guess there are some people who believe in open marriages where there's nothing wrong with sex with uh, whoever you want, but most people, even non-believers, and people with no other kind of, of moral standards, will tell you that it's wrong to cheat on your spouse. Now, most people believe that and know that, but many will do it anyway even many Christians, because they really don't believe that there will be serious consequences to it, as long as they're safe about it, or as long as they're sneaky enough not to get caught. But even if that happens and nobody does get caught, there are still very real, serious consequences to adultery. That's a biblical principle in general, but especially in this area, because God reassures us that sex is more than just a physical act. It's a spiritual component to it as well. Adultery destroys the marriage bond. And actually, scripturally, it's, it's given as one biblical grounds for divorce, that that is something that happens in a marriage. It damages your understanding of healthy relationships. It dramatically affects your relationship with God. 
And so many people like to believe that they will not reap what they've sown. And they can somehow get away with this sin that God has clearly condemned. No one gets away with this sin. Nobody. A second cultural myth about sex is that our passions must be fulfilled at any cost. Now, adultery, technically speaking, the definition of adultery is when a married person is having sexual relations with a person other than his or her spouse. Cheating on your spouse, that's what we understand to be adultery. It is prohibited by the seventh commandment. It's wrong, and as I said, most people understand this. But in the New Testament, the concept is broadened, and we are taught that sex between any two people who are not married to each other is what the King James Version calls fornication, or the modern translations call sexual immorality. And in fact, Jesus taught that just because you haven't cheated on your spouse does not mean that you haven't committed adultery. Even the sins that go on in your mind are the same thing, spiritually speaking, as adultery. There are many kinds of sexual sin. Premarital sex, one night stands, living and sleeping with someone that you're not married to, homosexuality, many, many other things that we could list. These things are fornication, that they are sin. Both adultery and fornication run rampant in our society. And when people seem to justify doing these things, they always cite their passion as the reason. Oh, we just got caught up in the heat of the moment, that we couldn't help ourselves, but we're really in love. Our feelings are real. You know, they can't be denied. And the underlying presupposition about that is that passions and urges <coughs> are so strong that they just can't be ignored. They can't be denied. They can't be suppressed. However, that line of reasoning neglects the fact that there have been and there are not plenty, millions of people all around the world who are living full, joy-filled lives without enjoying sexual relations of any kind, with anyone. Sex is not necessary for day-to-day -day survival, and some might like to think that it is. And also, if we say that sexual urges and passions just cannot be denied, do we also say the same thing about other kinds of urges or, or passions? For example, I might get intensely angry with someone, and that anger might be understandable. I might be seeing red, I'm so mad, I'm so angry. So does this mean that I have the right to fulfill that urge to just hit somebody upside the head because I feel those feelings. I was caught up in the moment. I couldn't deny them. That they were real feelings. I was very angry at the time, so it was okay, right? Of course not. Everybody says you just can't be doing that. Many passions and urges need to be suppressed when they are not appropriate. And sexual passion is often one of them. And that leads me to the third cultural myth. And that is this. The myth is sex is dirty. We need to be very clear about this. Sex within marriage is holy, it's pure, it's God-given. There's nothing dirty about it. Yes, it is intensely private and personal. That's why I'm trying to speak as much today in generalities as I can. It's not something to be flaunted or, or treated flippantly. But there's absolutely nothing dirty about it. Sex is not dirty. It is abused, it is made light of, it is talked about in the wrong way by many people. It is used for wrong reasons. It is flaunted as if it were as inconsequential as just going to the store and buying groceries. I mean, amazingly, to some people, how they vote is a more sacred and private subject than their sex lives. However, just because it is abused by some does not make it dirty. What attaches a sense of guilt or a sense of, of dirtiness to it is its misuse, not, not its proper use. So we've talked about some of the myths surrounding sexuality. Now let's talk about God's truth regarding sexuality. It can be summed up rather easily. <clears throat> sex is to be completely restricted to the marriage relationship. Sex is for marriage. Period. In any other context or other relationship, it is more harmful than it is helpful. All right, yes, I am aware it's the 21st century. My calendar says the same thing as yours. I just looked at mine this morning, it says February 2016. Although some people might think it says 1950 or something. I'm aware fully that most of our society believes that these ideas that I'm talking about today are completely outdated and completely unrealistic. It's just not the way we live anymore. People live together before they get married, if they ever get married at all. Couples have sex before they move in together. Teenagers are more and more sexually active. Women are choosing to have children out of wedlock. Homosexuality is the politically correct thing today. Even 
legal now for them to, I can't even say marry, it's not married, but to, to, to have that kind of union. Gay couples are adopting children. So, how can I spell these ideas in this culture in which we live? Well, let me tell you something. It's not my ideas we're talking about here. It's the Lord God who created heaven and earth, and each of us who says that all these things are wrong. And all these things have more long-term consequences than we could ever imagine. The confusion and the uncertainty of our children today is going to have lasting effects for generations to come because of the fact that things have not been done God's way. And as is often the case, the innocent ones are the ones who pay the, the heaviest price when selfish people do selfish things. Sex is somewhat like fire. It has great power in the right place, in the right time, used the right way. It is constructive and pleasurable and wonderful. But outside of its proper boundaries, it can cut loose with an amazing destructive force. Right here in this room, we can probably come up with at least a hundred stories about how sex was misused and how that misuse ruined marriages, ruined lives, and at least caused many unneeded hardships. And please understand me today, my purpose is not to pronounce a condemnation on everyone who has sinned sexually. I'm not trying to lay guilt on everybody who has messed up, because in some way that would include each and every one of us here today. The truth of the gospel is that no matter what you've done, no matter what consequences have arisen because of what you've done, there is forgiveness at the foot of the cross. Jesus died so that your sins could be washed clean. And through his blood you can be pure and holy and be made brand new. Yes, the consequences of sin may remain. Often, especially in the case of sexual sin, the consequences continue throughout our lives. But that doesn't mean you aren't forgiven. You can't be healed and cleansed through faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, I don't really care what anybody's done in the past. It's not my business. I don't care. It doesn't matter one bit. Whatever regrets or justifications you have, I don't even care about it. What I care about is what happens from this point on. I care that Christians understand that God just isn't some big killjoy up in the sky and that he didn't give these commandments about sexual purity to take away our fun and excitement. He gave them for the same reason that he gave the other commandments, because he loves us so much. And he wants to spare us from the worst kind of pain there is. Sex outside of marriage always brings pain. Sooner or later, it becomes a source of heartache and difficulty. I care that we as a church don't buy into the lie that God's commandments have changed and that there are no consequences for breaking them. You know what happens when you take a piece of scotch tape and you stick it and you unstick it to a surface a number of times? It loses the stickiness. Well, sex is God's sticky glue for marriage. It finalizes and it solemnizes the relationship in such a way that, that the husband and wife have security with each other. And children feel secure when parents who are, are faithful to each other remain faithful. When that is misapplied, it becomes like the tape losing its bonding power. Things just fall apart. The center doesn't hold. And so I don't make any apologies for being antiquated or decidedly unmodern in my views about the proper role of sex in relationships. If you just want to just write this off as some old-fashioned preacher's ideals, then go ahead, that's your choice. But if you really want to know the heart of God and His desires for your life in this area, you need to please just listen closely. Marriage is more than just a, a great friendship. It is a covenantal relationship, a sacred trust. And sex is so intimate and so powerful that it can only be entrusted to someone that you've entered into the sacred trust with. The truth of the matter is that you can very easily find someone who has engaged in premarital or extramarital sex who deeply regrets it. But I seriously doubt that you could ever find anyone who waited until they were married to have sex, or who ran from a temptation to cheat on their spouse, who regrets waiting, or who regrets remaining faithful to their marriage commitment. So God's main truth about sex is that sex should be completely restricted to the marriage relationship. But we also need to emphasize God's second truth regarding sex, and that is forgiveness. It's always possible. We need to remind, be reminded that God is a God of forgiveness. We've all sinned in this area one way or another. The biblical word grace describes the wonderful actions of God that allows us to overcome our past, to have our sin taken care of, to be right with God even though we've done some terrible things. 
We are studying the Ten Commandments, but we need to remember that we're not saved by following the commandments. And, thanks be to God, we're not condemned for not following them. We're saved if we accept Jesus as Lord. And we are condemned only when we reject Him and seek to try to do all this on our own. God's commandments are wisdom for us. That means if we're wise, we'll follow them, including this commandment to not misuse sex. So if you're married, you need to strive to remain faithful in thought and in deed. If you're single, you need to work hard at remaining pure for your own good. If you failed in this area in the past, you need to repent of that. You need to seek God's forgiveness, to accept the consequences of your mistakes, and to see the wisdom of God for you, and to pledge to try to be better in the future. In a graduation address to a university class, a former presidential candidate, Rick Santorum, told a story about a South Carolina preacher who worked his whole life to become president of a Bible college. As he fulfilled his life's dream and vocation, Alzheimer's disease struck his wife. Her health then degenerated to the point where he could not possibly take care of her and work his full-time job. And so he quit his job. His colleagues came to him and said, what are you doing? Your wife doesn't even know who you are. And the man answered, she may not know who I am, but I know who she is. She's the woman I made a promise to until death do us part. He said, all the ways down to that. That sex has been given to us by God to demonstrate that kind of commitment to our spouse. That kind of commitment that I see is so commonplace right here in our church, and I'm so proud to see. Any use of sex that does not do that is a misuse of that gift of God. So may we uphold the marriage institution as the illustration of God's perfect love for us. He talks about how we are the bride of Christ, and the union that we have with Him is a spiritual union, much like that union between a husband and a wife. So as we close today, perhaps there's someone needing forgiveness, maybe someone needing God's grace for the first time in your life to say, I, I want to be saved from my sins. Maybe there's someone who loves the Lord and you've decided that you'd like to join with our church and our, our best attempt to serve Him and to be faithful to Him. If this describes you and you'd like to make a decision,